So one of the first things that I want you to know is um, about this PowerPoint is you take away one fact, please. And that's that we have, we humans have more than one body. We have a physical body and a spiritual body. And the spiritual body is sometimes called the double, the resurrection body, the etheric and the astral. So just remember that we have two bodies, okay? When we start this. Okay, so now we're gonna go into Carl Jung's near-death characteristics. <clears throat> the year was 1944 and he had broken his foot. He had a heart attack and he felt like he was dying and he left his physical body. He floated in space and saw the sights that came into his view. He would have had to have been approximately a thousand miles above earth to see what he described. His reaction upon return was very negative. He had a typical painful period of readjustment because he lost his near death state. And while he was floating above earth, he saw um, the globe of earth. <clears throat> he saw the deep blue sea. He saw the continents. He saw the subcontinent of India and its global shape was plainly distinguishable because his uh, field of vision did not include the whole earth, but he saw slices of it. Its outline shone with a silvery gleam to the wonderful blue light. And sometimes the earth looks spot spotted dark green with oxidized silver in many places. He saw reddish gold hue and far away that was the reddish yellow desert of Arabia. He saw the Red Sea and far, far back he could make out the Mediterranean. And his gaze was directed chiefly at that, he said. He saw the Himalayas, but when he saw them, it was foggy or cloudy. He knew he was on the point of departing from earth. He saw a dark block of stone, like a meteorite. It was about the size of his house or even bigger. It was floating in space and so was he. He stated that when he floated in space, his body had been weightless. And um, remember the clairvoyant body, which is what you're in when you're out there, is not um, <clears throat> affected by gravity. And so do any near-deathers remember uh, feeling weightless when you were out there? There were blocks of stone and they were similar to the ones he had seen in the Gulf of Bengal. Some had been hollowed out <clears throat> into temples. And then there was an antechamber that was leading him. And he saw this Hindu gate to the temple. And to the right of the entrance, a black Hindu sat silently in a lotus posture upon a stone bench. The Hindu wore a white gown. Steps led up to his antechamber and inside on the left was the gate to the temple. Innumerable tiny niches, each with a concave saucer filled with coconut oil and small burning wicks surrounded the door with the wreath of bright flames. He had once actually seen this when he visited the Temple of the Holy Tooth at Candy in Ceylon. The gate had been frayed by several rows of burning oil lamps of this sort. And as he approached the steps leading up to the entrance into the rock, he felt that his whole earthly existence had been taken from him. And I am this bundle of what has been and what has been accomplished. He felt full and empty at the same time. This bundle had become everything of his life. And as he approached the stone temple, he had the certainty that he was about to enter an illuminated room and would meet there all the people to whom he belonged in reality. And when suddenly, up from below the direction of Europe, a likeness of his doctor floated up, framed by a golden chain or a golden laurel wreath. The doctor protested against Jung's going away 
and told him he must return. You have to get back. What are you doing out here? He says. And the moment he heard this, his vision ceased. And if you are out there flying around in the astral etheric world in your clairvoyant body, as soon as you have the thought to return to your physical body, you will return. So that's what happened to him when his doctor ordered him. And so this is what he said in Memories, Dreams, and Reflections. <clears throat> he was very disappointed as he was about to enter a temple where he would learn what his life's mission had been in his life. In reality, it took him about three weeks to make up his mind to live again. He couldn't eat, and it seemed to him that he had returned to the box system. That's what he called Earth, living life here on Earth. He had to convince himself that this was still important. He left a resistance to this doctor. He felt a resistance to the doctor. Resistance, he talks about being very angry, who had brought him back to life. Because the doctor had appeared in his primal form. I don't know what he meant by that. And whenever someone appears like that, he is going to die, Young said. Young told his doctor this, but the doctor didn't believe him. On April 4th, 1944, when Young was allowed to sit up on the edge of his bed for the first time since the beginning of his illness, his doctor became ill and died soon after. And during those weeks after the near death, he felt weak and wretched throughout the day. Gloomily, he thought, now I must go back to this drab world. Toward evening, he would fall asleep and his sleep would last until about midnight. And then he would become himself and lie awake for about an hour, but in an utterly transformed state. It was as if I were in ecstasy. I felt as though I were floating in space again. And though I were safe in the womb of the universe in a tremendous void, but filled with the highest possible feeling of happiness. This is eternal bliss, I thought. This cannot be described because of course you're in the fourth dimension. You only have words for the third dimension. It is impossible to convey the beauty and intensity of emotion during those visions. They were the most tremendous things I have ever experienced. I would never have imagined that any such experience was possible. It was not a product of my imagination. The visions and experiences were utterly real. Now, after his near death, he was much more honest in his writings, in what he felt and had experienced in life. And he was not so worried about being judged negatively by his peers. So we have psychic phenomena now and what Jung thought about it. He stated that after his vision, he felt he authored many of his principled works, and he was no longer afraid to lose his professional reputation by discussing or writing about psychic phenomena, including spirits. He began mentioning that his mother and some relatives were mediumistic. He continued work on synchronicity and the unconscious seemed to take a life of its own. And Jung believed that the unconscious had its own intelligence. Okay, metaphysical symptoms in which we live. In order to better understand psychic phenomena, it's necessary to realize the metaphysical system in which we live contains three realities. And these realities interpenetrate our lives, all of our lives. The everyday sensory materialistic reality in which I am speaking to you. The clairvoyant reality where near-death experiences and other phenomena happen that are spiritual. And then the transpsychic reality where miraculous healings happen. Um, <clears throat> so those are three realities that we live in and they are circling us all the time. Now the clairvoyant reality is where near-death experiences happen. The sensory reality first contains past, present, and future. The clairvoyant and the transpsychic reality occur in the now. You are right there now. There's nothing else. The now sense is one of being completely at home in the universe. Now opens up possibilities for us in our lives because we receive new information unavailable in the sensory reality. Near-death experiences occur in the now. And a great um, writer, Leslie Lupo, who wrote the book, Every Breath is Precious, talks about that in her book, about how near-deathers are in the now. Now, I have uh, a, fa uh, a favorite nerve, the vagus nerve um, that Jacqueline mentioned. <clears throat> and the vagus stays in vagus unless you breathe differently. That's that webinar that she's speaking of. 
Jung stated that the indicators of psychic processes <clears throat> stand in some sort of energy relation to the physiological foundation during these objective events, which we could call a near death and objective event, which can be interpreted as energy processing. So that's what he would call a near death now, energy process. The energy process, which is responsible for an out of body and or a near death, I believe, happens through your vagus nerve, the physiological foundation of your body. Now, Darwin named this nerve in um, 1872. He called it the pneumogastric nerve, and we just call it the vagus now. And here's a picture of your vagus. Now, if you were to look at an anatomy book, you would see a skull, and it would say right here, right about here, vagus. That's all that anatomy shows you about the vagus nerve. Um, <clears throat> so the vagus nerve comes in at the top of your head, goes around your neck, it touches the amygdala, which is fight, flight, or frozen. Now, fight or flight we know about. Frozen is what happens when you have problems in adulthood because of what happens in your childhood and you couldn't run away or fight somebody. So we have a famous Freudian story of somebody sitting on their father's lap being touched inappropriately and he's alone in the living room and he wants to know where mommy is and mommy's going to be mad and this shouldn't be happening to me and why is daddy doing this to me and all of those feelings the anger and he can't run he can't move freezes in his body so his cells remember now in this story what happens in addition is that a cat walks into the room and what he does is he displaces all these fears onto cat onto this cat so then he's 40 years old and he comes into my office or another therapist and he says, you have to help me with my fear of cats because I've n I don't have any memory of a cat ever hurting me. But <clears throat> whenever I see a cat, I get really nervous and panic. So with the vagus in panic and anxiety, what happens is the stomach remembers and tells the brain, danger, danger, there's a cat and his heart rate goes up. So what we do in normal therapy, we're not talking about near death now, for panic and anxiety, we just talk about that the out breath <clears throat> is what calms the vagus down. So you breathe, breathe in to a count of four, one, two, three, four, and then you breathe out, five, six, seven, eight, nine, as far out as you can go. And you keep doing that, and that helps you in panic or anxiety. So that's how I started learning about the vagus nerve, just to help people with that. And it seems to help them to know you have a nerve, it's your job to calm this nerve down. Um, okay, so it goes around your neck, goes down your spinal column into your heart, and then down your spinal column into your stomach. Now, I want you to pay attention just right now to this red bulb up here in the skull, um, because uh, when I went and found out about um, the clairvoyant part of this vagus nerve, or put it together when I was at Lilydale studying some mediums there, um, I came back and I had been working with the medium and I said, I wanted to talk to her spirits. And she said, okay. And I said, would you tell them? And she said, Karen, they can hear you. <laughs> so I'm talking to these spirits and she's on the phone. And I said, what is this red? First I said, is the vagus nerve connected to the silver cord? And they said, yes. And I said, how come I've never heard this before? And they said, well, because they wanted to keep it away from people. They. Now, it's important if you're talking to a medium to find out where your spirit, what time period your spirits have come from. And I don't, I didn't ask that question because I was too blown away by the vagus nerve and the silver cord were the same. Anyway, I asked them what this red bulb was in this picture of the vagus nerve. And they said it was a cowbell, a cowbell. Now, my grandmother had a farm and we had bells on the cows. And what they were for was to tell us where the cow was. Okay, in the pasture, so we could find them. All right, so I want you to remember this red bulb. And in right now, in our language, it's called the mandula oblongata. It's a part of your body. Okay, so just put that off to the side. Okay, so back to Jung. Um, he says, after 50 years of study, and his vision had shown him to believe that the psychic experience touched on the realm of nuclear physics and the conception of space-time continuum. So talking about um, quantum physics here, this opens up a whole question of the trans-psychic reality immediately underlying the psyche. The psyche is your mind, your unconscious, and your conscious. And that little voice inside your head, your mind, you take that with you when you go to the other side. 
So that Jung would say that this four dimensional place is right here underneath our soul <clears throat> in our unconscious. Okay, a possible connections to um, the vagus nerve, to spirituality in the psychic field is the silver cord. Now, near death experienced people, PMH tells me they don't see the silver cord. Well, some of them do, not a lot of them. I agree with her there. Um, however, some of them see them and mediums know about the silver cord um, a lot because they, um, mediums that have been mediums as kids, I remember them telling me stories of, they would be flying outside their body and their mother would call them for breakfast and get back in their body and go down and eat. So they know about the silver cord. So it does exist. Um, all right, now, <clears throat> breathing through the silver cord, how do we do that? Well, when you're out there in the clairvoyant world, it connects the physical body and your etheric double, which is the exact replica of you, only your ghost-like body. Um, it's the electromagnetic double, um, and it gives energy like a battery, the silver cord. It houses the chakras, which are also invisible. Okay, the soul, how does this fit? Jung really believed in the soul. He believed that that was your purpose in coming into this life, was to find out your soul purpose. Why are you here? And to live it. Okay, the soul starts in utero as a particle of energy in an atom. It's derived from God and who organizes the different parts of the atom. And as the soul gains experience, it grows larger. Okay. So here, the soul is a condensed intelligence in the atom. This intelligence is accompanied by spirit, the law of vibration, which gives it energy to use its intelligence. The job of the astral body is to hold your soul, to take it from your physical body into the astral etheric four-dimensional world. So your spiritual astral etheric body takes your soul out of your physical body. Now, how does it do that? Okay, we're gonna learn. Okay, now we have the spiritual and the physical body grow at the same time. The soul starts in utero in an atom, goes through childhood, and develops into adulthood, passing through many stages. Your astral body is a miniature of your physical body because it's always growing as your physical body grows, okay? And it's just lighter and smaller. Okay. All right, we usually connect to our soul when we are so-called dead. The soul in the astral body leaves the physical body, usually out of the top of the head. Usually. It doesn't have to all the time. That's just generally. Something pulls you out of your body. People say that, but they don't know what this something is. Yeah, so you leaving your body is like shedding your skin, like peeling a banana. And you do this in an outer body near death and when you so-called die. So sometimes as we go through life, we have a near death. The astral body and silver cord connects us to our soul in an out of body experience and then returns to earth. Okay, so that's, that's great. You, and so you come back in to your physical body. Okay, all right. It's different if you die and go the other side, you don't come back. <sighs> okay, so some people have done this. And Robert Monroe is one of those people. And he traveled about in his astral body, retaining consciousness. He said to leave one's physical body, the person needs to start turning by twisting the top of the body, the head and the shoulders first, and move slowly exerting gentle but firm pressure. Now, Robert Monroe left his body and came back in. He didn't have any spiritual experiences. He did not go to see the light. So. He just did this and practiced it. And then he started the Monroe Institute in Farber, Virginia, if you wanna go and learn how to leave your body. Monroe continued that the wave that would come over him rhythmically, head to toe, was like the energy that powers the orgasmic response until the vibration wave would begin instantly as if on a verbal command. And he practiced this over and over and tells you if you're gonna to start to leave your body, you only go like three feet and come back in. You do that about 30 times. The body is being shaken down 
to a molecular or atomic level. So when you leave, when your astral body leaves your physical body, it is atoms and molecules that are leaving. It contains your consciousness, though. And it resembles you because people would know if they saw it that it was you. Okay, so who else says this, that, that we have this, um, that we can do this? So here's a book by uh, Christine Schenk. And um, she said, the energy body in the zone on the ear level sends out an impulse to change rotation of the energy body when a near death is about to occur. The energy body increases its rotation, speeds up and flies up and away from the physical body like a helicopter. The energy body leaves the physical as the astral etheric body, remember that is not um, affected by gravity, so it can float and goes into the clairvoyant universe. Now, this lady wrote a book about the, about the energy body. Now, <clears throat> I happen to have some acupuncture appointments on my foot in the last few months, and um, I'm in there, and they, you know, put the music on and put all those needles in and say, now, think about your energy body. And I'm thinking, my energy body, right, what is that? <clears throat> so anyway, I bought this book because my acupuncturist, this was her teacher, and um, so I read all about the energy body, which then does turn into the astral etheric body. Now, have we ever had a, in a laboratory, have we ever seen this energy body that the acupuncturist works with on your foot or whatever other place you're, you're going to? No. Have you ever seen an astral etheric body in a lab? No. And I'm going to make that point in a, in a few minutes. Okay. So Robert Monroe said, that there are five techniques for leaving the body. So you can roll or vault out. Uh, you can flow out through the head. You can back out and you simply float upwards. So you just, your whole body floats from the physical body. Now you can read all about what Robert Reno says in three of his books. Um, and um, he, he was a great guy really. And, and, you know, went all over trying to get some help with this. He was the only one doing it. So, I mean, you can imagine you guys that have been out there, you have clients and other people and, and all of us telling you, validating this experience if you come and talk to us. But he didn't have anybody. So anyway, he did a great thing uh, by keep saying that he did this and he kept talking about it. He went to Topeka, Kansas um, to a hospital there. I can't remember the name of the hospital, but he asked them for a psych eval. And they, I said, I want to know if I'm crazy because people think I'm crazy. So they did a psyche bell on him and he was perfectly normal, was not crazy at all. And that was great that he did that because, you know, as Sheldon says on the Big Bang Theory, my mother had me tested. So he was tested. All right. The law of vibration. This is important. Write this down. A universal foundation is the principle of constant movement. The rate of movement determines the uniqueness and the expression of the vibration. No, the rate of movement is individual. So we all vibrate at different levels, right? Because of this law, a person can tune into the subconscious mind and the universal mind to receive psychic and spiritual information. Yes, that's how mediums do it. That's how we get our intuition. Yes. Now you have to note, vibration causes structure. So when this vagus nerve silver cord, which I think is, they're both wrapped around each other in your body like a rope and they vibrate, they're creating a tunnel because their vibration, it causes structure. So what else is it that I want you guys to remember? It's a lot to remember today. Okay, that you are energy in an energy field. Electricity is a single force that's never created or destroyed but is merely transferred from place to place, like your soul. Your soul is not born, it is created, therefore it never dies. So it goes to another place. The astral body, which contains the soul, is an example of this transfer. And humans are part of nature and nature is mechanical and organic. And it happens over and over again, right? That's the good news about all this. Okay, so there is a silver cord that connects our body, our soul to our body, which is not broken until we die. 
That's important. And in the Bible, it says that in plasticies, I think. <clears throat> and they say it's cut in the Bible. Well, it's not cut. It just stops vibrating. So then it loosens. All right. Now, <clears throat> PMH told me about this Vegas thing when I told her about it. She said, you know, you really might have something here about the breathing. <laughs> she wasn't excited about the silver cord. Um, she said <clears throat> that upon returning to Earth, a lot of near-deathers um, it find that they aren't breathing through their nose. And she had this because she, she had three near-death experiences. So she's driving down Broad Street in Red Bank, and she realizes she hasn't been breathing for 15 minutes. And so she'll pull over and meditate or pound on her chest to do whatever people do when they find they're not breathing. Because if you don't breathe on Earth, you die, right? So she said people get pretty panicky about this. And she told them that it happened to her, so it just happens. Well, <clears throat> I believe that when you go up there, you're not breathing through your nose out there, this little thing. No. Um, you're breathing through your vagus nerve, silver cord, or sometimes your whole body. Like, it's because it's an etheric body. So, of course, we need more research on this. But you're not breathing through your nose because when you come back, you can breathe without your nose. So that shows us. I get so excited about this stuff. All right, now let's see how we're going to do this. Here we go. Okay, Bruce Grayson. This this proves to me there's a silver cord in his book After, which was an excellent book. What a great book! Near deathers show an increased oxygen level during their out of body experience. Why? Because they're connected by the silver cord to their physical body. Their heart rate is still going. They're breathing. The silver cord keeps the two bodies, the physical and the spiritual attached and breathing and the pulse of the heart synchronized while being out in the etheric four-dimensional space. Now if that is improved, there's a silver cord. I don't know what does. This is one example proving the existence of the silver cord, which is the reason someone in an outer body or a near death stays alive. And I want you guys to tell me if you think this is true. Because everything I have read and researched says it is. All right. So the clairvoyant world cannot be studied by sensory standards. And um, <clears throat> what is an average medical doctor or electrical engineer from our sensory material world going to do with this etheric spiritual body, the vagus nerve and the silver cord, if they would be watching me right now? Well, they would, they would not believe it. I say, you know, she's, she's really out there, you know, with the fairies, as they say in England. Um, they won't see it either because they're not clairvoyant. So how are they going to judge if, they, if they're not clairvoyant? So this is why we need clairvoyant researchers to do further research on psychic phenomena. We cannot depend on the sensory scientific world to be anything but naysayers about this. Or else they just don't talk about it. <clears throat> They do not see the now. The clairvoyant world cannot be studied by sensory standards. Okay, so we need more research. <clears throat> Near-deathers get a glimpse of going to the other side or upstairs, as the fourth, fourth dimension is sometimes called. The first phase of life after so-called death has been described as unobstructed in comparison with earth, which is obstructed by matter. We got all kinds of hard things here. Um, to our sensory senses, matter is solid. To a spirit, matter is not solid. He or she can pass right through matter and distance is no obstruction either. So we certainly need more research in and about this unobstructed and clairvoyant universe. Okay, so here you have your astral, etheric, and spiritual body. Now, I had a dream one night, and in this dream, I heard a voice that said, God twists the vagus. I wasn't sure what it meant then, but after studying this stuff, 
I thought about it the next day. And we have spiritual centers um, in, in this body that the vagus is um, in. Uh, and they are the chakra centers. So you go from your base chakra um, <clears throat> up to your, let me just read them to you. Uh, from your base chakra, you have a spleen area that's a psychic center. You have a solar plexus in your stomach. You have your heart that's a psychic center. You have your throat and you have your third eye and you have your psychic crown area. And this is where you leave <clears throat> unless you leave, you know, the other three ways or four ways that Monroe said you could leave, but mostly you leave out the top of your head, just generally. And they say during sleep, we can leave too. And um, I don't have any memory of that. Um, but we certainly leave during an out of body and near death or at death. So this is how when mediums are being used as this battery, when we go to a medium to talk to our loved one, they receive a lot of their psychic information right around the head. Um, and because um, there's a spiritual ear back here um, and some people say, well, they receive it here, but mostly, and if you've ever had a, a spiritual phenomena where you've heard a voice, it's not inside you, it's out here that you hear it. So um, anyway, this, this is human channels of psychic energy and um, that's a whole nother webinar. But these three pictures are what I want you to remember. The, the oxygen level going into near-deathers when they're out there, uh, that you can leave your body, and that you do it through this vagus nerve channel um, that's right here. Oh, and of course, I want to read this to you. Okay, so after I, I heard about this um, God twist the vagus, I thought about it, thought about all those spiritual centers chakras that are invisible but they're there uh, we meditate through them and everything so you have the spiritual centers and the vagus nerve vibrating to their fullest as a conductor of energy and um, as shank said the energy body in in the zone on the air level sends out an impulse and that's where um, robert moreau said you move you start moving there um, with the sum of rotating channels could wind its way the soul up from the sacrum because that's where the soul and the silver cord stay, you know, when you're running around your physical body, through the vagus, in the middle of our sympathetic and parasympathetic sections of the nervous system, as chemicals are being released and all the everything's vibrating, pierce the center of the skull where the pineal gland opens the top chakra and you go out. And that results in your leaving your body with your consciousness with you. Now, that red bulb, that's the mandula oblongata. And that is, it, it has involuntary functions of the physical body, which are done without thought, right? So the mandula oblongata, as I would like to call it, um, can changes your breath from the nose to your body up there or to the vagus nerve silver cord. And, and your breathing ultimately changes while you're up there. And then you come back down to earth, right? And you're sitting in a car driving, which is a meditative state. Another meditative state is standing in a shower. You also get good ideas in the shower and sitting in the car because it, it, it's easier to bring in intuitive thoughts from our spiritual guides or our guardian angel, whatever you want to believe, or people up there that love you. Um, but that's how I believe that these people have problems when they come back in breathing because something has clicked. And, and once some, you've clicked that mandula oblongata, that red bulb that told us what pasture you're in, then you can click it. It just clicks automatically. So don't be afraid. Just, just know that this is a result of your near-death experience. Okay. So learning about the clairvoyant world is important. And number one is I've taught my webinars on Jungian psychology, the importance of the unconscious, the afterlife and paranormal spiritual experiences that people have. This information seems to bring peace to people. I have discovered many people and therapists who have psychic and mediumship abilities that they don't usually discuss due to perhaps being thought to be crazy. Number two, Perhaps if more family members of near-deathers could learn about the clairvoyant world 
and clairvoyant experiences, they would be more understanding when their loved ones leave temporarily for the unobstructed universe. I'm interested to hear your stories, um, any stories from near-deathers or any kind of spiritual experiences about breathing problems, of course, once they have returned to earth. And if any of you can remember the different ways that you left your body during their near death. So please feel free to email me at karen at karenherrick.com. The growth of knowledge is a cumulative and collaborative process, which needs then to be disseminated to the public. We need to get more of this out there. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your interest in Carl Jung. He said all of this should be studied in the future and he was right. In doing so, I believe it gives a rebirth of meaning and coherence to people's lives. And then another important thing to remember is when you come into this world or you leave it, there's a connecting cord. And that's part of nature. This is my third book, The Psychology of the Soul and the Paranormal. We have many illustrations in here, the psychic centers and all that stuff. It's uh, available on paperback and Kindle and also now on Audible. And I guess it's free with an Audible trial. I've never tried to do that, but that's what Audible tells me. And if um, any of you want to go any of my websites, I have a new website now that's called Karen E. Herrick for my grandmother's middle name, Edith. Um, and you could go on that for any new information. But life is mainly about soul growth and I wish you love and peace on your journey. And I'm going to have my technical guy come in and show me what to do correctly. I'm never gonna go through this again, so I apologize again. <laughs>